Good evening and welcome. My name is Megan Lovett and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Director of Continuing Education. Thanks to each of you for joining us this evening. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array, an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this by offering presentations such as this one, as well as online courses, videos, podcasts, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our final three courses of the spring semester started yesterday. Courses include Call to Conscience, Eucharist, the Heart of Catholic Life, and our online book club. Our online book club selection is author Oster Austin Channing Brown's best-selling book, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. There are a few spots left in these courses, so if you're interested, there is still time to enroll. Please visit our website, bc.edu slash crossroads for more information. We will also include a link in the chat to register. Thanks to our speaker for granting us permission to record today's webinar. As soon as the recording of today's presentation is available for viewing, likely within a month, we will notify all registered participants of the availability of the recording. At the end of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer. Please feel free to enter a question into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen during any time at, during the presentation. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. You will notice a closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. Many thanks to Dot and Danny, graduate students here at the SCM, for assisting with the closed captioning for us today. I now invite Father Thomas Segman, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Megan, and good evening to everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation, The Sacred and the Secret, Lessons from Movements like Me Too and Church Too. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Natalia Imperatore Lee is a professor of religious studies at Manhattan College in Bronx, New York, where she also coordinates the Catholic Studies program. She received her BA from that great Jesuit school of New York City, Fordham University. She received an MA from the University of Chicago and her PhD from the University of Notre Dame. BC people kind of like to make remarks about Notre Dame, but she received a very good degree and had a wonderful, we we're talking about her, her director, Dr. Catherine uh, Hilkert, uh, Sister Catherine Hilkert, a, a wonderful, wonderful scholar. Dr. Imper Imperatore Lee teaches courses on contemporary Catholicism, including Vatican II, as well as courses like Sexuality in the Sacred and Women in Western Religion. Her research interests focus on Catholic ecclesiology, in particular, the intersection of ecclesial identity with feminist and Latinx Catholic thought. Her book, Quintime, Narrative in the, Ecclesiast in the Ecclesial Present, explores how narratives shape ecclesiology. Dr. Imperatore Lee is also interested in the relationship between Catholic theology, sexuality, and education, the intersection of Mariology and ecclesiology, intercultural theology, gender studies, and the relationship of women, the poor, and other marginalized groups to church structure and governance. It's an impressive list of interests and uh, speaks to a very fertile mind. A Cuban-American native of Miami, Florida, Dr. Imperatore Lee has served on the governing boards of the Catholic Theological Society of, of America, CDSA, and of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the US, uh, OCTUS. She's a member of these organizations as well as the American Academy of Religion. And she's also served on the board of Future Church. Dr. Imperatore Lee speaks regularly at parishes, at universities, and in other venues about feminism, faith, and the Latinx communities in the United States. Her writing has appeared in Theological Studies, a great uh, Jesuit theological journal, also in the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, and in more popular venues like Commonweal and America magazines. She's appeared as a guest expert on Pope Francis on CNN and MSNBC. We are very honored, very honored to have a distinguished scholar join us as uh, Natalia is. Welcome, Dr. Imperatore Lee. We eagerly await to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much, Dean Stegman, for that wonderful introduction and thank you for pointing out all of the Jesuit pieces of my 
career trajectory. I really enjoyed that part. Thank you also to Megan Lovett for the invitation. Um, it's a joy to be with you today at the STM. It's a place I hold in the highest regard as a training ground for the future leaders of this church. The subject of my remarks today is contentious and sensitive. It provokes deep feelings and sincere anger, I think, from many people with many different commitments. I'll be talking about assault and abuse. And if these are difficult topics for you personally, you should be aware and feel free to step away if you need to. As Megan mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and made available to registrants. So you might choose to watch at your own pace if the material is something you find distressing. A second major theme of this talk is unapologetic feminism. <laughs> And if that's difficult for you personally, then I invite you to not walk away, but rather to stick around. In fact, feminism is only the first of the scary words that I get to use in this lecture. Intersectionality, Latinx, these shibboleths will appear time and again um, in my remarks. After a brief introduction where I'll, where I'll set out some terms and define them in the context of this lecture, I wanna talk a little bit about Me Too and other feminist movements and then I'll proceed with three realities that must be confronted if we are to unpack how abusive cultures operate in our church and our world, misogyny, shame, and secrecy. I'll conclude with one proposal for a way out of this mess. I know that I'm old because when I arrived at Notre Dame to start my PhD 20 years ago, gulp, feminism had become kind of a dirty word and certainly not a word compatible with Christianity or Roman Catholicism. Feminism though, is merely the belief that women are human beings in the image of God, that being a woman is neither a handicap nor a moral failing, but a way to be fully in God's image, alive and enjoying self-determination, responsiveness to grace, the rights and responsibilities inherent in one's baptismal promises. I approach feminism from an intersectional lens, which has also recently become a popular scare word, although all it means is that I'm acknowledging in my analysis that racism, sexism, classism, and colonialism are all interconnected and intensify one another, sometimes in ways that are difficult to perceive. As a light-skinned, some would say white-passing Latina, I reap the benefits of racial injustice, even as I am marginalized because of my sex and ethnicity. But honestly, we don't have the luxury of quarreling over words anymore, not at this time in this church, in light of everything we know about the rampant abuse and harassment of children, women, and other vulnerable persons in our church and in our country. Just last year, three women came forward in NCR with details of how David Haas manipulated and abused them spiritually and sexually. He ran a camp for teenagers. He had particular special friendships with teens who caught his eye and he memorized their 18th birthdays. That detail stuck with me. Many, many other survivors have also come forward. Earlier that year in a horrifying report commissioned by the L'Arche community, we learned that its founder, Jean Vanier, a hero to so many and someone who was hailed as a living saint for his work with adults who have mental disabilities abused his power and preyed on women who came to him for spiritual direction. And this is the thing. Sooner or later, this news will come to light about someone you admired, regardless of your ideological slant. Just this week, the president of my older son's high school was terminated for cause. The cause was inappropriate speech and touch to persons in his office, including subordinates. On a completely different end of the ideological spectrum, the founder of the Legionnaires of Christ, Marcial Maciel, was an absolute monster. He abused young boys and seminarians. He fathered six children with four women, some of whom he went on to abuse as well. He was a rapist and a morphine addict who got seminarians and others in his circle addicted. He was also hailed as an important fundraiser and benefactor of the Roman Catholic Church and enjoyed the protection of Pope John Paul II for far too long. Pope Benedict removed Maciel, sentenced him to a life of penance and silence, 
and put the Legionnaires under new direction. But the abusive culture persists in this group with allegations of abuse and cover-ups, priests sent to ask abuse victims to lie and settle for a cash payout, things like this. And we know that these are only the most visible stories, but the singular stories that make headlines like these shouldn't obscure for us the banality and the ubiquity, the everydayness of sexual abuse in our church. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report named more than 300 priest abusers and several bishop enablers only a few years ago. The lists coming from dioceses, religious orders, and now even lay organizations like L'Arche or publishing houses like GIA make this abuse crisis seemingly endless. I certainly don't have to tell people with any familiarity with Boston how endless it seems. So why bring them up? Because the very first step in learning from movements like Me Too and Church Too is to look at abusive cultures straight on. If we look away because we are squeamish or because we don't want that kind of negativity or we choose to focus on the positive, we're effectively turning our backs on the suffering of vulnerable people around us. And let's not make a mistake. In cultures that use authority and secrecy as currency, all of us are potentially vulnerable people. So let's set out some terms at the start. I'll be talking about sexual abuse, assault, and harassment. These are not all the same thing, but they all flourish in similar cultures. In fact, some cultures are particularly receptive hosts to sexual misconduct that can vary from hostile environments to child rape. Sexual assault is defined as sexual contact that occurs without the explicit consent of the victim. 80% of these are committed by someone known to the victim. Sometimes this is couched in euphemisms like non-consensual sex. The word for that in English is rape. Sexual abuse of children refers to any kind of sexual contact with a child, since children cannot consent to sexual activity of any kind. Sexual harassment encompasses a variety of behaviors that range from unwanted sexual advances, the creation of a hostile work environment, all the way through lewd or targeting comments, even into rape or assault in the workplace. They're not all the same crime, and nor do they carry the same punishments. What they have in common is the likelihood that perpetrators will get away with it. It is notoriously difficult to get victims to come forward, in large part because our justice system is not hospitable to survivors of sexual abuse. We live in a culture of rape, which I used to think was just a hyperbolic, sensationalized way of talking. But really, rape culture is the assumption, and I think we were all raised with it to some extent. I remember watching Back to the Future with my sons and just the ubiquity of rape culture just kind of hit me. It's the assumption that given the opportunity, men will assault women sexually, that men have uncontrollable drives and women must take steps to prevent harm to themselves. That's rape culture. That we assume that this is how men are, or this is just the way the world is, that it tends toward rape. So we need to put guardrails in place, like carrying mace, or taking a self-defense course, or not jogging at night, or not jogging with headphones. Because to make oneself vulnerable is to invite the inevitable. That inevitability, that is the normalization of assault. It's a culture of rape. Activist Tarana Burke coined the phrase Me Too in 2006 to bring attention to the pervasiveness of sexual harassment women face in the workplace and the world at large. The phrase became part of our national lexicon in 2017 when it began trending on Twitter, <laughs> accompanying women's stories of harassment and assault. It grew like a tsunami of horror. Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Juno Diaz, Tavis Smiley, Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose? I mean, isn't PBS supposed to be a bastion of culture? When I was growing up in Miami, I always assumed it was like the most American thing you could do was to get your news from Charlie Rose and Tavis Smiley. But it turns out that they were grotesque predators too. And like the Catholic cases I referenced above, these are just the headline grabbers. The real headline is all the women who raised their hands in recognition, 
oh yeah, that's definitely happened to me. Oh, of course I've had employers make sexual comments or touch me inappropriately or a stranger holler at me on the street. Oh yeah, someone in a position of power over me has made comments about my body or my intimate life. I remember being struck by the amount of men who had disrobed in their offices during the workday. I thought, I didn't realize how common this was for men to just not wear pants at work. I didn't realize that we had to codify this. Like, how did we not know that this is sort of out of bounds behavior? And I think one of the reasons is a level of sort of comfort and ownership of the public realm. Women have been here before in this Me Too moment. In the consciousness raising groups of the 60s and 70s, women were seeing their experiences of invisibility and harassment played out by their friends and neighbors. Early feminists of this period referred to the sense of recognizing your own experiences in the shared narrative of another as a feminist clique. Jewish theologian Judith Plasko refers to the yeah, yeah moments of meeting, meetings of gra women graduate students at Yale. That feeling of hearing someone complain about something that you thought was just part of life, like getting referred to as sugar or getting asked to refill the coffee or getting passed over for a promotion because you were just gonna have kids anyway. Being invisible at work or doing the double shift. Yeah, yeah, that happens to me too. Yeah, I also feel that way. In these gatherings, something clicked for women. It was the click that broke through isolation and into solidarity. Also, it wasn't just me. I didn't bring this on myself because I'm not assertive enough or because I give off a vibe. The boss is doing the same things to my coworkers. Once I do that, I realize that I don't have an isolated problem. I have solidarity with those who share my problem. And together, we have a movement. The consciousness raising that gave rise to second wave feminism helped white middle and upper class women secure important rights like the holding of money and bank accounts and credit cards in their names. In fact, I learned the other day that JCPenney was the first department store to allow women to open a line of credit, not under their husband's names. So all these white middle class women um, enjoyed that credit extension, the normalization of working outside the home, some recognition of the labor involved in caring for children and families and households. But that movement left many women behind. Writer and activist Sarah Ahmed refers to, refers to a different kind of feminist sound, not a click, but a snap. Like a branch on a tree, she says, women who are derided, harassed, raped, silenced, and disbelieved eventually get to a point where they snap. The snap is loud and women who snap raise a stink. They demand to be noticed, they demand justice. But more often than not, particularly in the case of women of color who suffer marginalization on the basis of their sex and their race and their economic class, these women are viewed as problematic, as prima donnas, as demanding troublemakers who are difficult. Why? Because we hear the snap, but we never consider the pressures, the indignities, the harassment that bent that branch until it could no longer bear the weight. We should think very seriously about how often our cultures focus on the snap as being violent and not on all the abuse that bent and bent and bent that branch as pre-existing violence, a first violence, to borrow a phrase from Gustavo Gutierrez. So some women click and some women yeah yeah, and some snapped and now many of us have said me too. The common ground to these sounds is the emergence that after the initial light bulb moment of solidarity, the unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice. Not a terrible definition for the church, if you think about it, a unifying experience that prompts us to work for justice. The same year Me Too was trending, a Nashville-based poet, Emily Joy, added her own hashtag to the mix, Church Too. Joy wanted to bring attention to how Protestant pastors, evangelical pastors in her specific case, groomed young people for assault through youth programs and other church fixtures. Her hashtag and the wave of reaction to it revealed how predators select 
and prepare victims through seemingly innocuous channels like youth groups or mentoring. Even Catholic theologian Emily Reimer Berry has surmised that the way we in the Catholic Church catechize children with an emphasis on obedience to authority and the secrecy of the confessional, along with the attendant shame about sin, might lay the groundwork for abuse. Everything is so broken. The problem seems so deep-seated in our institutions and in our culture that it can seem hopeless. Further, it seems that the tendency towards sexual assault is not confined to the Catholic Church or to the business world, both of which tend to be organized hierarchically, since abuse also flourishes in communities that are organized presbyterally or conciliarly or charismatically. Abuse and harassment flourish in Hebrew schools and in the Boy Scouts, at PBS and NBC, in urban and rural areas. Predators exist and they seek access to children and other targets. It's one of the most terrifying things about parenthood. Predators don't look creepy, which is one reason why they are successful. So let's turn now to our attention to three other factors that contribute to abuse tolerant and abuse enabling cultures and what we might do in terms of next steps. Most of my students and my family and peers wish we could just move on from this constant talk of sexual abuse, harassment, and assault. Moving on can sometimes mean walking away or changing the channel, and that's very tempting. But if we're going to move on as followers of Christ, we must not look away from suffering or watch something else. Moving on for the church will involve at least three confrontations with misogyny, with shame, and with secrecy. In other words, it's time to have serious conversations about sexism, sexuality, and clericalism in this church and beyond. Only by moving through this desert can we emerge on the other side transformed. So first we're going to try and confront misogyny. Misogyny is not a word I heard a lot growing up it sounds kind of extreme and implausible. Hatred of women isn't really something that you can pinpoint on a person. We all have moms. We hear it more frequently now, but I fear it gets confused with regular old sexism or even discrimination. The feminist philosopher Kate Mann has written a magisterial work on misogyny called Down Girl. In it, she reorients our understanding of misogyny away from feelings like hatred, which are impossible to quantify, and located in the person doing the hating and therefore dependent on their self-reporting and self-awareness. For a man, and I'm quoting here, Kate Mann, quote, misogyny should be understood as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order, which has the overall function of policing and enforcing its governing ideology, end quote. It is, in other words, not something psychological in the person who may or may not hate women, but rather an action, a thing done, a punishment felt. Not all women feel the punishment because after all, the law enforcement will only in interfere with women who get out of line. What is the in line we are held to in patriarchy? Well, for Kate Mann, women are expected to be, and these are her words, men's attentive, loving subordinates. Does that sound familiar? to the Catholics here. As Catholics, we have particular images of good womanhood. Ask yourself who you think of when you think of a good woman or who Catholics are supposed to think of when they think of as a good woman. Mary, the saints, few of whom are women, even fewer of whom were women who were ever married and fewest of whom are women who were sexually active throughout their lives. Women who aren't good, are bad. Badness for a woman can mean a number of things, but overall, these offenses are classed as violations of the good standard. So not virginal enough, not deferential enough, not nurturing enough. In, in the Catholic realm, good womanhood has been presented to women almost entirely wrapped up in suffering. The Mater Dolorosa of the Pietà the mother who frets for her son's sanity, the mother who gives birth silently in a barn or a cave or a manger, the mother who frets about her child lost in a temple. 
Of course, the relationship between Mary and Jesus is unequal. He's fully divine and human. She's merely human. But that this relationship has become a template for all male-female relationships is the problematic through line in Catholic theology with which we must contend. The history of subjugating women in Christianity is not a mere accident, and it's not really all that temporary, and it's not something that we can easily brush away. While some scholars have made compelling cases for why Jesus was atypical in his treatment of women, accepting them as disciples equally, not condemning women in adultery and rape situations, the same cannot be said of Jesus's followers. The sexism in our theology and in our church runs very deep. So I'll just run us through some greatest hits. Tertullian taught that each woman was another Eve the devil's gateway through whom sin entered the world and because of whom the son of God had to die. Ouch. Augustine taught that men were in the image of God, but women were not because women were aligned with the body and men with the spirit. Women were only in the image of God when taken together with a man. Aquinas taught that we were defective males. This is, mind you, only one trifecta of many, many ways in which the Christian tradition communicates women's inferiority and justifies our subjugation. Most recently, we see this in the complementarian theology that comes from the Vatican since the pontificate of John Paul II. Complementarity is the belief that men and women are two halves of a whole, right? It's an echo of Augustine almost, and that the gifts of each complement or complete the other. This sounds beautiful and very romantic, right? Didn't Sandra Bullock at one point say, you complete me, or maybe it was Renee Zellweger. It sounds like a lovely part of God's design after all. It's based in a, an assumed biological or genital complementarity of men and women. Not to deny any kind of biological complementarity, but let's ask ourselves, does biological complementarity necessarily imply psychological complementarity? What about social complementarity, academic, employment complementarity? One crucial flaw in complementarian thinking is that it takes biological assumptions about sexual intercourse, namely that it is always done one way and for one reason, and turns that into an entire social order where men are initiatory and aggressive and women are receptive and nurturing. So we get women's special nature and vocation to motherhood, spiritual or otherwise. We have no similar documentation of men's nature or men's vocation, either because it is assumed or left wide open with possibility. Hmm. Receptive and nurturing, where have we heard that before? Women are to be men's attentive, loving subordinates. Keep in mind that misogyny doesn't discard women. It assigns women crucial roles. We are, after all, necessary for the propagation of the species. And that propagation is indeed very special. I am a mom myself. But being made to feel special is not the same as being given the freedom of self-determination. A pedestal is a prison. Sometimes when I read the pains that papal or papal or Vatican documents go to, to emphasize the special necessary nature of women's voices, the need to protect women from clericalization or from the messiness of work outside the home or of politics, quite frankly, I wanna scream. It is a template for misogyny, a how-to for becoming an attentive, loving subordinate. And honestly, have any of you ever lived through norovirus with children? Women, least of all mothers, do not require protection from mess, and we've never gotten it. We're mired in it, which is what the complementarian thinking will not allow. In this vision of perfect complementarity between husband and wife, between Christ and the church, the perfection glosses over reality that two-parent households where the mom stays home to care for the kids has always been the province of the white middle class and used as a cudgel to talk about the irresponsibility of non-white parents, for example. 
complementarian theology is problematic because it relies on and perpetuates stereotypes because it is essentially a template for misogynistic thinking by setting the parameters against which women will be judged and maybe most damningly because it is not real. Real mothers cannot be nurturing all the time without depleting themselves. Real life is messy and ambiguous and there are bills and layoffs and sometimes women get very angry and aggressive. Sometimes they're not subservient or pleasant and sometimes they even initiate sex. And that's what we're gonna start talking about now. Just as we have to confront how deep the roots of misogyny go in our Christian tradition and all the ways in which the church has furthered the agenda of patriarchy and the domination of women, sins of commission, we must also look long and hard at a great sin of omission. We have reneged on our responsibility to teach young people about sexuality in productive or healthy ways. I have many, many stories here because I teach a class on sexuality and the sacred as Dean Stegman mentioned here in New York. And maybe it's because they're Irish, I don't know. But most of my students were never told anything about sex by their parents. And their church painted sex almost exclusively through the lens of sin and therefore shame. Even in a regular gen ed religion class, if you ask for an example of sin, you always, always get premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality. Sometimes I think the contemporary gospel, at least the one believed by most Catholics, is contained in those three prohibitions. Roman Catholic teaching on sexuality remains rooted in an Aristotelian notion of biology, where the male is the generative principle and the female is the receptive one, as we saw in the complementarian theology I was just talking about. Our church teaches that the only licit sexual expression occurs in the marriage bed of a heterosexual couple that does not use contraception of any kind. Outside of marriage, virginity or celibacy is expected and taught. In this country, purity culture has filtered in with an idealized notion of sexuality helped along by the popularity of the theology of the body. What I learned in high school about sexuality was something along the lines of when in doubt, don't. Don't is the overwhelming theme. Don't be gay. Don't have sex before marriage. Don't masturbate. Don't have impure thoughts. Don't use contraception. Don't get pregnant. Don't have an abortion. Don't lose your virginity. Furthermore, where our notions of social morality, like Catholic social teaching, have since the 19th century been framed as, quote, principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and guidelines for action, end quote, our sexual morality is still acts based. That is, rather than principles, criteria, and guidelines that assume a moral agent capable of discernment in the complexity of historical circumstances, sexual teaching is still propositions from the past about procreation, for example, held up as absolute moral laws to be obeyed or disobeyed. No moral agency or discernment needed, no shades of gray, if you'll pardon the best-selling pun. With our money, we're able to discern the right course of action for ourselves, our family, and our world. With our genitals, we must be told what to do because our consciences don't work. And what has that brought us? Humane Vitae came out in 1968. More than 90% of Catholic women of childbearing age use birth control. Did it bring us more holiness? Or did it just drive people underground with their sex lives? The naming of homosexuality as intrinsically disordered happened in 1975 in Persona Humane. Did that make fewer gay people? No. It drove them to hide their identities and then to leave the church, in some cases taking their families with them and in others alienating them from the people they loved. Today, other than pre-Cana, we have very little forthright discussion of sexuality in Catholic circles, or we did until the sexual abuse crisis happened. And that's the thing. Abuse flourishes in cultures of secrecy and shame. Our sexual teachings are almost entirely shame based. We hold up Mary, a literal impossible ideal, since she is a perpetual virgin and also a mother, for girls to imitate. The failure is built in. 
purity culture, as we instantiated in Catholicism with our emphasis on abstinence and the sacredness of sexuality that is not explored in any meaningful way before marriage, but should always be open to life is toxic because purity is toxic. The Lutheran theologian and pastor Nadia Bowles Weber notes that we've confused purity with holiness, but purity is about preservation and separation from pollution. Whereas holiness is about union with something, namely God. Other thinkers like Ruth Everhart, who studied the Me Too movement and the church's response to it, note that purity and virginity cultures are dangerous to young women in many ways. First of all, the most prized thing a woman has, her virginity, is something that can be taken from her by force without consent. Secondly, Consent, which is a necessary part of sexual activity, is completely overlooked in cultures of purity and abstinence. Before marriage, consent is seemingly not allowed, and after, consent is assumed. Everhard notes that the more conservative church cultures provide a seedbed for abuse. Homosexuality is taboo. Abstinence is the answer to all teen questions about sex. Modesty is paramount and violations are virulently shamed. This drives all sexual activity into a realm of secrecy and shame. And this is a red carpet for abusers. I recently reconnected with a friend from Miami who is a psychoanalyst who works for the church. And he has worked with both seminarian admission screenings and with abusive priests and with survivors, along with many just run of the mill priests. You know, it, it's crazy to think, but your priest might go to therapy. That's kind of great. One thing my friend notices, we're talking one day about the non-integrated sexual identities of some of these men and how difficult they are to treat, is that some of the men who come to see him are incapable of even naming sexual things without resulting to euphemisms. They cannot bring themselves to use anatomically appropriate words for body parts or to speak about arousal in anything but veiled ways. How can we expect integrated people to emerge from climates where we cannot talk about sexuality or about desire or about sexual expression? How can we foster a culture of concern about the intimacy of sexuality if we cannot even bring ourselves to say the words, if even the words are shameful? Even more devastatingly, how can we expect victims to come forward when we have shrouded all genital activity, even abuse, as a unique source of shame? The pedestal applies here too. When we elevate sexual expression, like the theology of the body does, to a quasi-liturgical thing, when we glorify marital sexuality as if it were a mystical experience in every instance, then we're trafficking in shame. Because real life does not work that way. We teach our young adults that sex is to be avoided, and then on their wedding night they are to, what, flip a switch and come to see sex as a defining feature of their marriage and an ultimate good? Talking about sex only through a lens of fear and shame is toxic and reducing sex to a contract where one party, usually the woman, can give or withdraw consent like a candy machine is not the answer. What we need is a sexual ethic of concern, concern for self and other, concern for community, concern for integrity. But instead of accompanying young people who are marrying later and later, through their biological sexual exploration, we leave them in the wilderness of shame and silence. This contributes to the abuse crisis and forthright conversations about sexuality way before pre-Cana are an important start. So now the third confrontation, secrecy. Creating programs that start conversations about sexuality is an important investment in the future of our church and our world. But that's not the only or even the immediate response that the sexual misconduct crisis calls for now. Ruth Everhart gives us three indicators of a potentially abusive church culture. Quote, any tight knit faith community can become a breeding ground for abuse and secrecy, especially if it revolves around a charismatic leader, is reluctant to address issues of sexuality forthrightly, and is self-policed by an elite group, end quote. Since we talked about that second factor already, I wanna focus here on one and three and have a serious conversation about clericalism. 
Clericalism is an important cause of the sex abuse crisis. The belief that the clergy are exempt from human failing and are somehow superhuman has deep roots in the Christian tradition, namely in the notion of higher and lower states of life. Prior to Vatican II, and still in the subconscious minds of many Catholics, there are some states of life that were, well, holier than others. The priesthood or consecrated virginity or religious life for women was viewed as the highest state of life, the closest to God, because it was the denial of physicality, right? namely of sexuality, since as far as I know, priests and nuns still eat, in favor of spirituality. The idea that physicality and bodiliness were not godly because God is pure spirit comes, as you know, from Christianity's fusion with Greek philosophy. But those of us who couldn't hack celibacy could somehow still be a little holy in the lay state. After all, this is when marriage was understood to be a haven for lust. This Greek influence still lingers, and I'll prove it, right? When, when you think of what happens when you die, what goes to heaven? Whenever I ask my students this, it's always your soul. <laughs> Never your body and soul, right? Your soul is what's clean and pure and disappears. The abuse cover-up and the abuse crisis um, did a lot to put an end to the states of life idea, reminding us that priests and bishops are also human beings capable of great sin. But it lingers. In part, this is due to our historical and theological myopia. We mistake the way things are for the way they've always been, or we read into scripture more than is there, particularly when it comes to Jesus establishing the priesthood as it exists in the present. The, clauses, the causes of clericalism are historical, scriptural, and even psychological. But the effects of our clerical culture have been devastating, not just for lay people in the church, but for the clergy themselves. The first effect is the insularity of clerical culture. As an all-male institution with male hierarchs and decision-making roles, clergy are and remain accountable to clergy. While parish councils and lay review boards exist, these are largely in an advisory capacity, which means clerics are free to listen or to ignore recommendations. There are exceedingly few examples of situations where lay people have the power, for example, to fire a priest. Although, well, we can talk about it in the Q&A. The insularity and monoculture of the priesthood breeds a kind of entitlement which, to which the laity no doubt contribute. What do I mean by entitlement? How many priests do their own laundry and cooking and cleaning? Do we expect that kind of work from priests or even from our spouses? <laughs> Why? Are they not human beings? Are we not human beings? Entitlement operates in many ways, and we don't always experience it as the danger that it is. After all, even Vatican II encouraged the laity to support the mission of the church. And isn't helping father with meals or a cleaning lady or the like supporting the mission so he can focus on other things? But entitlement is dangerous, and entitlement coupled with insularity is particularly so. If we learned nothing else from the abuse crisis, if we continue to learn nothing else, it is that an insular entitled class of persons cannot self-police. Our tendency towards self-protection and the economy of secrets, particularly sexual secrets, create a climate where truth is sacrificed again and again. Consider, if all sexual sins are horrifically shameful and you know you have yours, how likely are you to expose those of the people you work with who may know your secret? Or in a less insidious example, consider the notion of scandal. Our biggest problem in Roman Catholicism over the last 40 years has been a profound misunderstanding of what might scandalize the faithful. As Everhart puts it, evil resides in the actions and inactions of people who fear the wrong thing who fear exposing evil when they should fear complicity with evil, who fear damage to reputation when they should fear damage to the vulnerable, who fear the demands of pursuing justice when they should fear the consequences of not doing so." End quote. Where some thought if lay people found out about pedophile priests, there would be a scandal, it turned out that the actual scandal was the massive cover-up that tried to prevent the truth from coming out. 
we thought that pedophiles would besmirch the church's good name, and they do, but not as much as watching the mechanisms of power circle up to protect them against the claims of the victims. We are constantly afraid of the wrong thing. We're afraid that the church will look bad, and that fear leads to decisions that make the church look worse. Moreover, we have a culture of sacrifice in the church. I mean, it was just Lent. We must be aware that our tendency to sacrifice should never apply to the truth, particularly the truth of violence against a vulnerable person. The last effect of clericalism is something that applies broadly to many men in our culture, and it is Kate Mann's notion of hympathy. That's H-I-M-P-A-T-H-Y. Hympathy, which is a great word, is the excessive sympathy we show to perpetrators of sexual violence. Our reluctance to believe that people we know or people just like us or people we trust could be capable of monstrous acts. We need our monsters to look like monsters, in other words. And when they don't, when they look like people we have been taught to respect, Charlie Rose, we are far more likely to disbelieve an accusation than we are to hold one of these golden boys accountable. Hympathy is a great word for a very old phenomenon. Look at McCarrick, at Vanier, at Maciel. This line from Kate Mann is devastating in its accuracy. Quote, the idea of rapists as monsters exonerates by caricature, end quote. Because these people don't look like monsters, we refuse to believe that they are. Admitting that monsters look like everyone else gets at our original point the terrifying, heart-stopping ubiquity, the everydayness of sexual violation revealed in the Me Too movement and its Church Two corollaries. Now, it's easy to despair at this point, right? To look around at the amount of abuse and cover-up and sin and evil and just throw up our hands in desperation. To look at our victim outreach or lack thereof and recognize that we've decided on a ministry to survivors that Everhart correctly names a ministry of absence absence of safeguards, of recognition, of lament, and of justice. To see how our empathy compounds the victim's pain. So what can we do? I only have time for one suggestion, but I think it's a good one. Believe women. Imagine if we just did this. I don't, believe, I don't mean believe all women, regardless of countervailing evidence. I mean, start from a position that women are trustworthy narrators of their own experience. It sounds so simple. And here's the kicker, it's biblical. When I teach feminism in scripture, my students are always struck by the reality that women couldn't testify in court in, in a variety of cultures and religious traditions because women's testimony counted for nothing, right? It was automatically discounted. Oh, how they are shocked, shocked by this. But look at, for example, Christine Blasey Ford's testimony. We routinely, disbelieve women. When we talk about sexual assault, for example, in colleges, where women are twice as likely to be sexual assaulted as they are to be robbed, I will always get a student who raises his hand and says, yes, but a lot of times girls are lying. Or the more insidious, but no less disbelieving, what about due process questions? So here's the truth. Statistically, the amount of false rape reports is between two and 10%, which is the same rate as false larceny reports or other crimes. Victims are no more likely to lie about sexual assault than they are about robbery. Some of those two to 10% are baseless, which does not mean false, but rather not proven false. But fewer than four in 10 rapes are ever even reported. There is far more violence occurring than ever makes it to the authorities. Not that the authorities are super great when they receive a report anyway. So what would happen if we believe women? Why shouldn't we believe them? Is it our desire to maintain a specific social order? Let's look at what happened the last time a woman telling the truth upset the social order. This is from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised as he said, come see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he has been going, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. New Testament scholar Claudia Setzer, my colleague at Manhattan College, notes the anomaly that all four gospels make women the first witnesses to the resurrection. Mary Magdalene. On her word, the male disciples run to see the empty tomb. The gospel writers, had they wanted a stronger case, could have omitted Mary Magdalene if they wanted and just let the men be the first to see the risen Christ, but they did not. Because of the evangelist decision to leave Mary Magdalene in the story, Christians ran a huge risk of embarrassment. After all, the central claim of Christianity is predicated in all four gospels on the previously worthless testimony of a woman. So it would seem that Christians can be people who trust a woman's experience, what she has seen and heard. Perhaps then it is time to recover that aspect of the tradition and become a church that believes not only women, but if we're going to use that intersectional lens, then we should work to believe all those who are marginalized. That is how we will show what we have learned from Me Too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for giving us so much to think about and to reflect on. And um, it was a difficult topic, but one that I think is so needed. Um, before I get to the questions in the Q&A, did you want to revisit the, um, the topic about removing a priest from leadership that you mentioned? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I did want to mention that recently in New York, the, the head of one of the high schools here was removed by a lay board. Um, I think, obviously, in consultation with... Uh, the Jesuits, but um, but it was, I think, one of the first instances that I took note of where laity had this kind of, um, you know, decision-making power. And so I didn't want to sort of paint it with a lot, with broad strokes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we can dive right into the, to the questions a lot. Just thanking you for, for your presentation. Um, there's one that, that it's hard to share. Um, one of our participants is a man and he, he was actually a victim of sexual abuse. Um, he says, even within church settings. And if you could speak more about culture that abuses men, mm -hmm. um, ridicules men. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I wouldn't want us to think that sexual abuse and harassment or sexual misconduct is something that only victimizes women. It certainly victimizes all kinds of vulnerable people, right? Men who are in vulnerable situations, whether it's seeking counseling or seeking spiritual direction or, you know, just suffering in some way. Um, men who are perceived as weak. Um, but, and that's, that's the thing, that's the red carpet. <laughs> right? Any sense of vulnerability is uh, an invitation, right? And, and the thing is, is that as a church, you know, I'm an ecclesiologist, I'm always thinking church thoughts, but as a church, it's our job, it's our whole calling to be a place of refuge for the vulnerable. That was, that was Jesus's whole ministry, which is why we have to be so careful about secrecy, about shame, about sexuality, and how we talk about these things, because it doesn't just victimize women. Um, it victimizes anyone who is in a vulnerable um, position vis-a-vis -vis the victimizer or the, the perpetrator. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to our participant for, for sharing something that was very personal. Um, this question posed, have you encountered recent works by theologians David Toombs and Jamie Reeves who present careful analysis of crucifixion narratives in the gospel that thoughtfully suggest that sexual violence was like, likely part of Jesus's crucifixion? If so, what implications do you think such understanding might have for the community of believers, especially survivors in the Catholic church? Wow, that is a great question. And yes, I have seen the work of David Toombs. I have to look up the other um, scholar as well, but I'll write it down from the chat. Um, that yes, that Jesus being stripped naked on the cross is a form of sexual um, humiliation, sexual violence. And therefore that, that Jesus is in solidarity or is, is himself also a victim of, of sexual violence. I think that's really powerful in terms of networks of survivors and how to, to find ways to 
reach out to survivors that are not sort of based in, in pity or shame or that might intensify their victimization, but rather might raise up their experiences as something in which God himself participated. Um, that's really great work. And, and there are others who are working, um, whose, his name escapes me right now, but Telling Truths in Church is the name of the, of the, of the book. I read it over the summer in one of these reading binges <laughs> that COVID has afforded me to sort of keep saying. And it was all about sort of the way we talk about sexuality and, and the, whether, you know, our, our obsession with keeping Jesus modest on the cross when in all likelihood he was naked on the cross, that kind of thing, how that speaks more to our own issues surrounding nakedness and sexuality and vulnerability than it does about anything that, that may or may not have happened um, to Jesus. So yeah, I think that those are, those are really important resources for thinking about how we can, um, we can make space for the voices of survivors and have them lead the way in, in, in helping the church make reparation for the damage um, that they've suffered. Thank you. And that kind of segues into maybe our final question that we'll get to today about, you know, there's just seems to be an overwhelming amount of work to be done. And so where do we start, um, you know, looking at cultures all over the world, where do you see hope for the future? Yeah, that's really hard um, because it's hard as it's especially, I think, hard to be hopeful this week. It's it's a, a horrible week for systemic racism in our face and sexism and abuse. And and it can seem like the, the evil is overwhelming. Um, and I think one way that we can start is by being brave with our own experience, um, being brave in our own families. Uh, even preparing this lecture, which I had been working on, you know, for several months, I've had conversations with not close family members, but family members who suffered sexual abuse. I mean, they're, they're from a different generation, but it's not something that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And even being able to talk about it in our family situations might be an opening to sort of, to say, you know, this, I'm a person who cares about this, who wants this to be different. Um, we can have I, have, I have two boys, a, a preteen and a teenager, and we have conversations like this all the time. I don't know all of the answers. I don't know how to navigate college and dating. I, I, I don't know, but I do know that I want to be a place where they're not getting shame from me, mm. right? Where they're not learning to keep that secret from me. And that's something that, that I've done. And I mean, again, I'm Hispanic. I'm, I'm a Latino woman. I'm Cuban. And growing up, you know, it was always a fun game to have secrets and, you know, an adult would like slide you a piece of candy and say, it's a secret. Don't tell your parents. Don't tell your parents. And I taught my sons never to keep a secret, even if it was like my mom telling them not to tell me that they had an extra cookie or something. And I was like, you can always tell me you will never get in trouble. Secrets are never something that you keep from me. And if an adult asks you to keep a secret, you need to tell me. Mm -hmm. So little things like this can start to kind of build resilience in our children and build sort of conversational pathways where we're not only talking about bodies and sex in terms of sin and shame, but in terms of sort of ownership and, um, and sort of self-determination. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the church, I think we just have to keep pushing. We have to not let it rest, not let the voices of survivors go silent or be silenced um, and keep pushing at the parish level, at the diocesan level, at institutional levels for this work to still be done. Um, part of that is what gets done at the STM, right? The education of seminarians and lay women and, and lay men all together, right? That is a very important model moving forward, I think, for the church, that we're learning from women, with women, alongside women, seeing each other as collaborators and not as people on two sides of a divide, I think is really important. Yeah. Well, thank you for being you know, one of the voices that are, is working towards change and for being part of our, our webinar series. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure. 
we agree. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience members for being with us today. Um, we have one more uh, spring webinar. It's going to be Thursday, April 29th at the same time, 6 p.m. Eastern. The Power to Preach, a conversation about ordaining women as deacons. Um, so a nice, a nice connection, I think, to, to tonight's topic. Um, so this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.